Funding for Shaper Illus is provided by Raycon Earbuds, the sponsor of today's video. And you know what? Given this video's subject matter, let's do the sponsored portion right now before the talking horse makes us all sad by the end. So yeah, Raycons. I can't stress enough how great the everyday E25 earbuds are. They fit so comfortably in my ear and the sound quality they offer is just excellent. The everyday E25 earbuds offer 6 continuous hours of playtime, simple Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice, noise-isolating fit. Plus, they got a ton of great colors. Raycons are great for working from home, working out, and listening to music and podcasts for hours, without driving your roommates, significant other, children, or neighbors crazy. I can finally watch quality educational content without disturbing everyone around me. Huzzah! Raycon earbuds started about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market, which is amazing given the level of sound quality they offer. They're incredibly budget-friendly, yet they sound just as amazing as other top audio brands you know. If you want some for yourself, go to buy Raycon com slash shafrillis to get 15% off your offer. Click the link in the description box below. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash shafrillis. And thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video. Bojack Horseman is the best thing that ever happened. Oh, okay, 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 for real though. Why? Why is this show about a talking, alcoholic horse commonly considered to be the most well-written, emotionally powerful TV show ever by a large number of people? How is this even possible? Well, I've wanted to talk about this for quite a while now, but truth be told, this video was easily the most daunting project ever in my mind. I mean, the show ended in January, and I'm only now making a video about it in current month. Clearly, I didn't know what to do. Where was I supposed to begin when dissecting a piece of media this masterful? I had no clue. So I called William. Hey William, help me, I don't know what I'm doing ever at any time. Yeah, I noticed, but how many ads I had to cover for you? See, William, of the YouTube channel Space Tree Studios, was into this show way before I was. I jumped on the bandwagon shortly after Season 3 premiered, and I didn't exactly love it at first. My thought process was, BoJack Horseman is probably the best show I've ever seen. But it's not my favorite. Not by a long shot. My position has since changed, but I think it's notable that back then, I really couldn't stomach some of the uglier sides of these characters. The raw, palpable, far too real actions of these messed up people. The warts and all. But, we'll get into all that later. There's always later. For right now, William and I are going to take you on a retrospective journey throughout all six seasons of BoJack Horseman. And by retrospect, we mean retro. Sex. Thank you and good night. Wow, William, that's so funny. Amazing. I don't regret this at all. Anyway, explain how this works. This will be broken up into three separate videos. Okay, scratch that. It was gonna be free videos, but then I edited season one, and that alone was 25 minutes, so now it's just gonna be one video per season. We went from making this two videos to making this three videos to six. Yeah. So with that said, let's take it back to where it all began. Season the First. Season 1, at least the first half of it, is the most familiar to what an adult anime is shown 2014 was expected to be like. This isn't a mistake. In the commentary track for Season 1's DVD set, Raphael Bob Waksberg said that before they knew they were going the Netflix route, that they made episode 2 as sort of a second pilot episode. Where episode 1 was starting a storyline, episode 2 was meant to be just an episode. Like you'd see out Family Guy in case the show aired on TBS or something. As a result, the first half of season 1 is generally considered to be the low point of the entire series by most fans. And this was reflected in the critical reception of the season as well. Season 1 was the one that was received the worst by critics. This is due to many outlets only being screened the first six episodes of the series. In the commentary, Waksberg even noted how some critics left comments essentially saying, You know, for a comedy, this show seems kind of dark. Like... You're right there, guys. You're right there. We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. After the whole debacle, Rotten Tomatoes had to change the rules for Netflix shows, saying that reviewers had to watch the entire season to review it, which, I mean, 
Duh. Imagine playing only 45% of a game and giving a four hour time to IGN. Hey, wait a minute. To be fair, if you're going strictly by the first six episodes of this season, I can understand writing it off as nothing special. The first half of the season mainly serves to introduce us to these characters and get us familiar with their personalities and interactions. It's not a good idea to jump into heavy themes right away. It's important to pace your show and get the audience hooked on the characters first. And I think they do a really good job at laying down the groundwork for not only how these characters operate, but how this world operates. A world filled with talking animals that act the exact same way as humans is kind of a risky prospect. It could come across as an alienating concept to some people. Like, at the end of the first episode, we find out that Diane, a human lady, is in a sexual relationship with a yellow Labrador named Mr. Peanut Butter. His first name is literally Mr. I know that's not the part of this I should be concerned about, but still, this is Bonkers! I mean, look at all these weird ass names. Lenny Turtle Tob. Mr. Peanut Butter. Princess Carolyn. Textina Aquafina. Hank Hippopopolis. Herb Kazaz. Sebastian St. Clair. Quentin Tarantulino. Doctor Who. Yes? But over the course of the season, you start to forget that these are talking animals because they simply act how people would act. Sure, there's a plethora of jokes about the animals exhibiting characteristics of the animal they're based on, but for the most part, you just kind of get sucked into this world and start to see every character as just being a person. Kind of like how you would see a space alien like Gamora in a relationship with human boy Star Munch. I mean, this is just a person in green makeup, so it's easy to suspend disbelief this way. And that's how the animals in this universe operate. They're just regular people. Besides, I've seen weirder pairings. <laughs> So how exactly are our main cast introduced? Bojack's intro establishes much of what you need to know about him. It opens with a clip of an episode from Horsin' Around, a Full House styled sitcom from back in the 90s, before showing him on an interview in present day. You already know two key facts about him. He's a Hollywood celebrity, and he's a washed up drunk. Also, he is horse, and horse is stubborn. After that, we get the theme song, which is not only catchy as hell, but really makes you feel like this horse man is dead inside, going through the motions of life and trying to deal with all this shit around him every day. The theme song, in a way, is its own character, since over the course of the series, it changes depending on what characters are currently in or out of Bojack's life. But we'll get to all that later. For now, William, tell everyone about our favorite lovable sidekick who wears red and probably reproduces asexually, Toad. Wow, James! Toad is first introduced as a wisecracking serial bandit of Bojack's house, a role that he totally fulfills for the entirety of this. Okay, enough of that. Todd's introduction is an outlier. In the first three seasons, Todd's role is that of the comedy relief. So he's mainly here just to play as a comedic photo Bojack and tell jokes. However, as we'll get into later, once another character fills that role, Todd undergoes a shift as the show progresses. So his intro isn't as key as others when looking into these characters. Bojack and Todd are basically just comedic foils to each other. No more. No less. But I think that's a valuable role for this character to play. Having someone more innocent and optimistic around to balance out Bojack's cynicism is a really nice touch. Shortly afterwards, we get introduced to Princess Carolyn and her pretty fun dual role as Bojack's agent and his ex-girlfriend. She's established very well and- Oh, never mind that, we don't have time to talk about her because who's that dog? Mr. Peanut Butter! Now, I find Mr. Peanut Butter's introducing- I meant to say introduction, introduction in the script, but I, it, I put introducing. I, that, it's fine. So Mr. Peanut Butter's introducing to the series is pretty interesting because it's a bit of a misdirect. His intentions when he talks to Bojack aren't exactly clear at first. I thought he was supposed to be the smarmy douche rival who subtly rubs his own success in Bojack's face from time to time, and I was not about that. No siree. <laughs> Oh my God. But as the season goes on, it becomes apparent that he's actually a more good-hearted and innocent character than he initially seems. I'm not sure if that was intentional, but it was a solid subversion and I ended up really liking him as the series progressed. Out of the main five, he might actually be my favorite. As for the final character of the main five, let me explain how we get to her. Bojack's gotta write a book about his life, and he insists that he can do it himself without a ghostwriter's help. Chapter... One. That doesn't work out. He finally gives in to getting a ghostwriter, and Todd tries to cheer him up with a party. 
A party that also happens to be a quinceanera for the daughter of a crime lord. This subplot is only here because Aaron Paul breaking bad reference. True, but it's also the beginning of the many Todd shenanigans that give this show a comedic edge. It's fun to see how the mischief Todd gets himself into intersects with the slightly more grounded storylines of the other characters. So at the party, Bojack is finally introduced to Diane Gwynn. Diane's introduction is minimal, a contrast to her actual role in the show itself. She's established as a ghostwriter to help Bojack's book get off the ground. She also wrote a book on Secretariat who had a huge influence on Bojack, giving both of them a connection right off the bat. Bojack and Diane are the heart of the show, and their working relationship is only one small part of it. Right off the bat, you can tell there's an interesting connection there. Until a wrench is thrown into the works. Turns out Diane is dating that Mr. Peanut Butter guy from earlier. Doggy doggy what now? And then Bojack vomits cotton candy. I hope that didn't land on someone's house. So that's the first episode, and the way we meet these characters we're gonna spend the next six seasons with. It's a solid introduction comedically, and it's somewhat intriguing. Episode 2, however, is what really sucked me in because of its outlandish premise and great jokes. I was pretty on board, and then episode 3 happened. No. Who wants chocolate chip pancakes? I don't. I'm on a diet. Prickly Muffin is an episode that is important for context in future episodes, but on its own, it's kind of weak. It establishes Sarah Lynn, the little girl from Horse and Round, a show from back in the 90s, grew up to become a Kesha-type pop singer, and hit a downward spiral and ends up living with Bojack for a little bit. This sets up the relationship between the two. It highlights Bojack's inner desire for a family. Bojack is reliving his time on Horse and Round by acting as her surrogate father once again. He also sleeps with her, highlighting that he is horny. The action on its own is kind of sketch, but in later contexts, it becomes a whole lot worse. Sarah Lynn is also shown to be following Bojack footsteps in a way through her abuse of drugs and alcohol. But that's most of what this episode does. It sets up events and pieces for later episodes to build on. On its own, it's got some funny stuff here and there, but isn't very noteworthy. Though props to the team for burning the ottoman and keeping it burned for the rest of the season. I remember how that was a huge deal back in 2014. Continuity, guys! Whoa! Never heard about that before! So yeah, important episode, just not one I ever want to rewatch ever because it's gross and uncomfortable. Episode 5, on the other hand, is uncomfortable and and not necessary to watch. I guess it's significant to establish that Diane had a horrible family life, similar to Bojack, but honestly, just by hearing me say that, you know everything you need to know for future episodes. This one honestly feels like time wasted with a bunch of awful assholes, and it's my personal pick for the worst episode in the entire series. But I guess it's important to see how Todd ends up in jail in the next episode, so maybe you should watch it, I don't know. However, episodes 4 and 6, despite being mostly comedic and sitcom-y and overall pretty good, hinted something a little more serious to come. Bojack does stuff that seems pretty heartless, such as sabotaging Todd's rock opera by hiring character actress Margot Martindale to get him to notice a video game that destroys his life and sends him into a downward spiral so he'll stay on Bojack's couch forever since Bojack is terrified of being alone. No, I won't elaborate on any of that. And Bojack's potential romantic interest in Diane leads to some significant conflicts with Mr. Peanut Butter, culminating in him drunkenly stealing the D from the Hollywood sign, and Mr. Peanut Bobber taking credit for this stealing as a sign of his love for Diane. It's bonkers stuff, but you wanna know the best part? That D never gets replaced, and from this point onward, Hollywood is no more. Everyone in the show refers to it as Hollywoo from now on. A change that is wholeheartedly accepted in his never questioned by anyone ever. I love this, both as a funny joke and an example of the extreme attention to detail and continuity present within this show. So these are the first six episodes, a mostly comedic yet slightly dramatic satire of Hollywood and the people who live there. I think it's decent overall in spite of a few bad episodes, and I was intrigued to see where it went next. And I had no idea what I was in for. Episode 7 is a pretty big shift in relation to what we just saw in the first half. In the previous episode, Bojack gets a call from his old friend Herb Kazaz and is off to Malibu for the duration of the episode. As such, this episode focuses mainly on Princess Carolyn and highlights her struggles, her relations with her co-workers, her boss, how she has to constantly fight two and nail to succeed in this business. This episode even ends with a bit of a gut punch. She is now 40 years old and is still just an agent with no real family to call her own. In a show called Bojack Horseman, the writers know that Bojack is not the only character and make sure to give most everyone proper development. 
But of course, nothing compares to the paradigm shift of episode 8, the telescope. Here we get some backstory surrounding how Bojack became a star in the first place, how his best friend Herb led him to huge success by creating Horsin' Around, and how Bojack, concerned over his own career, stayed silent while Herb was ousted by the network over being gay. Now Herb has cancer, and Bojack realizes that this is his last chance to make things right, apologize for what he did, and get closure. This is the most important thing for Bojack right now. He needs closure, and to be told that what he did wasn't wrong, because he didn't have a choice. To which Herb replies, Okay, I don't forgive you. Herb, I said I'm sorry. Yeah, and I do not forgive you. And Herb is completely in the right. He doesn't have to forgive Bojack for anything. Does it suck for Bojack? Yeah, but Herb is in his rights to do so. And of course, Bojack being Bojack has to push and push and push and effectively ruins that relationship completely. A relationship that we see more of as the series goes on and you eventually realize looking back just how crushing that really is. There's so much finality present when Herb says, now get the fuck out of my house. And it kicks off a recurring trend. The F word is only used once per season during a pivotal moment where Bojack ruins a crucial relationship in his life. This restraint makes each of these moments hit particularly hard. But the sad thing is, it's warranted every single time. The telescope is the most indicative of what the series was truly meant to become. It signifies that this is not a show designed to make you feel good or give you closure. It's designed to show you how messy and awful real life can be sometimes. How relationships can be destroyed and never recover. It's hard to watch, but also necessary. And most shows wouldn't end an episode on such a melancholy note, let alone most animated shows about talking horses. But this show clearly strives to be something different. The next episode, revolving around Bojack's attempts to break up Diane and Mr. Peanut Butter, follows a similar trajectory. From the beginning, it's just assumed that Bojack will romantically get with Diane over Mr. Peanut Butter because that's just how story structure works. Bojack and Diane have to get together. It just makes sense. And the episode does end with Diane and Mr. Peanut Butter no longer dating. Instead, they're married! Whoops! This, to me, solidified the idea that the show wouldn't have any easy answers. Life doesn't go the way you want it to most of the time, and you have to accept that. Like, sometimes you want to sabotage a wedding, but then life says... Oh shit, forgot about jury duty. You have no idea what it's like to come my park this week. Oh, and there's the paparazzi bird subplot that they use as another smaller way to demonstrate how things don't always go the way you expect. They build up these two paparazzi birds trying to blackmail Bojack for a few episodes of the season, and then during the one episode where Vanessa Gecko is his agent, she quickly sweeps them under the rug by threat of litigation. What if you wanted to blackmail a celebrity and God said, One million dollars. Or sometimes you want to use character actress Margot Martindale to break up a couple, but that just brings the couple closer together and Margot Martindale gets arrested. Margot Martindale more like Margot Martin Jail. <laughs> I guess now is as good a time as ever to say that character actress Margot Martindale is my favorite character in the entire show. This inexplicably bloodthirsty diva, based on the real non-bloodthirsty actress of the same name, is an absolute delight every time she appears on screen. In general, this show is filled to the brim with amazing side characters, and there's plenty of great ones in season one alone. Lenny Turtletob is always hilarious, Pinky Penguin is pitifully poor, plus perfectly plucky. And who could forget Neil McBeal, the Navy SEAL. I sure can. He's only in one episode and a cameo at the very end. Shut up. But I do have one steamy hot take for all y'all, and you're not gonna want to hear this, but here it is anyway. I did not care for Vincent's adult man. What? D did not care for him. How could you not care for him? What's wrong with him? I mean, he, okay, he, he he was funny for one episode, and they they just should have stopped it there. They 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 ran him into the. I mean, he he just he insists upon himself. How does he insist upon himself? He's free toddlers in a he, trench coat. He, they don't even know what insist means. That that's the only that's the only joke with him, and and they they just keep they keep driving that in, and they they just he has more jokes. They, he has rake hands. Yeah, but they, they just they, they they didn't know what else to do with him. They just Bojack has the same thing. He, it's three toddlers in a trench coat, and it, it, they they just I, I I can't even watch the episode season. I, I haven't even finished them. How you, like how have you not finished them? How are we making this a video if you haven't even yeah, you, finished the series? You know what? I I just I, every, every time I get to the episode that where they're, they're dating and he he's like the the episode where he's in 
Princess Carolyn's apartment. I, I, I just, I, I, I just can't. Would you like it more if he was just free Bojax in a trench coat? All right, look, look, look. He, he, he was fine in the one cameo in season three. He was fine for one episode. It was funny, and then it stopped being funny in the second episode. That was enough. Okay. Yeah, well, you know what's not funny? What? Improv that goes on too long. Let's get back to the f script. All right. Anyway, moving on to the penultimate episode of the season. Episode 11, Downer Ending. Another unspoken trend with the series is that every second to last episode of each season has some major shit go down. Some intensely dramatic, paradigm shifting, flat out insane shit. It's probably no coincidence that these second to last episodes are some of the most acclaimed in the entire show. Anyway, even though season 6 has 16 episodes, and thus all the shit goes down in its episode 15, I'm still gonna call this the law of episode 11, cause I just like that better. Now this season's episode 11 isn't as climactic or important as the later ones, but like the title implies, it has an absolutely gut-wrenching ending. And you wouldn't expect it, since it's pretty bonkers at first. All this dark, serious drama is juxtaposed against an utterly ridiculous drug trip of Bojack, Todd, and Sarah Lynn. It's also the first episode to get experimental in this animation, with some different styles being used, like this Peanuts parody. It's also one of the only episodes of gore. The show doesn't really get violent with its comedy like other animated sitcoms, but here it works given the context. As the episode goes on, however, the trip slows down and we are shown Bojack's deepest desires. A life by a lake with Charlotte, a daughter, and a nice simple life. But after we get emotionally invested in this life Bojack could have had, the drugs wear off, and he's left lying alone. Utterly, entirely alone. So he goes to a ghostwriter meet Diane is appearing at, and he asks her one crucial question. Am I a good person? He needs Diane to tell him that in spite of everything, in spite of how messed up he is and how much of his life he regrets, he needs to hear from Diane that he's a good person. And she can't say it. It's a scene that hits entirely hard because of how well it's subtly built up. There is no reason for Diane to tell Bojack what he wants to hear. There are no easy answers. He's done so much horrible shit, and she just can't tell him that everything he's done is okay. Because it's not. It's a downer ending, alright. Probably the most heartbreaking moment in the entire show so far. Hey, aren't you the horse from horsing around? The final episode of the season brightens things back up. Another recurring trend for each season of the show. Many plot points for next season are set up, like Bojack getting a chance to star in his dream movie, Secretariat, and Diane getting a call from the dashing Sebastian St. Clair, who wants her to accompany him to war-torn Cordovia and write about his exploits. Oh, also that book they were working on finally came out after Diane leaked it two episodes prior, and it's a major hit, winning Bojack a Golden Globe, beating out Boy Herd in Grand Budapest Hotel for Best Picture. No, I will not elaborate on that. Towards the end of episode 12, Bojack and Diane are seen on the roof of her house, and their exchange is a pretty good summation of Diane's character and the mission statement of the show itself. Bojack asks Diane if she thinks he could at least be good deep down, to which Diane replies, That's the thing. I don't think I believe in deep down. I kind of think all you are is just the things that you do. People are complicated. Everyone has the capacity to change and better themselves, but you have to actually work and make that change. Just because you want to be good doesn't automatically make you good. This is the driving force for the show from this point forward. It's not just who you are inside, it's who you actually are in your actions that matter. The episode ends with a nice montage of all the characters we've been introduced to over the course of the season living their lives, getting us intrigued as to what's next for them. And that is Season 1 of Bojack Horseman. Overall, a pretty good start. The first half wasn't amazing, but once we got introduced to the cast and saw how they interacted with each other, the season revealed its true form and became a dramatic tour de force while still keeping its excellent sense of humor. As a whole, it's probably the weakest season in the entire show, but considering how good it ended up being by the end, I think that goes to show just how phenomenal this show would go on to be. Season 1 is probably the most standalone season. What I mean by that is that while it segues nicely into season 2, by the time you get to season 3 and so on, looking back, season 1 is almost a completely different show tonally. In a way, I feel like some of the events that happen here aren't so much setting up future events, as it is future seasons retroactively making it more.
more important. Especially season six, but we'll get there when we get there. That's not to say everything is like this, as they were definitely building towards certain goals, but season one in general feels less important for lack of better words. But from this point on, the bar is raised to incredible highs, because after this, we got season two, which is arguably the best season of the show's run. 